And if you've brought your copy of God's Word with you, why don't you open with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. It's a really, um, we have a very interesting, we're at a very interesting place in Matthew's Gospel right now. Um, If I were not teaching Scripture uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, this this section would probably potentially be a section that I would never preach within a, the context of a Sunday morning service because there's, there's really there's no in, imperatives here. There's no, <clears throat> there's no in, engagement for us to then go and do something. This is another text, as I'd mentioned last week, where we're just learning. And, and I want you to think about it this way. Uh, Matthew, as he's writing his gospel perhaps somewhere in the late mid-60s to early 70s uh, in A.D., he's writing it as we've typically heard primarily to a Jewish audience, right? You've heard that before. So whenever we get to sections like this that are indeed of historical value and significance and an understanding of Old Testament prophecy and how it's and how Matthew is weaving that in here as Jesus is training his disciples, I want us to keep something in mind as we do this. This isn't just an academic exercise. Sometimes Bible churches get labeled, oh, they're just all into education. They're all head, it's all about head knowledge. Let me promise you something. Matthew, his, I, would, I, would, I can promise you, his hope and his heart's desire was that his primary readership, his brethren, according, his kinsmen, according to the flesh, that when they read this portion of Scripture right here, that to us may seem like an academic exercise, it was to him for them to be an evangelistic exercise whereby their eyes would be open to understand more of who Jesus Christ is and come to a place of repentance. So this portion is actually a very evangelistic portion of Scripture intended for the saving of souls. Amen? That's what the Word of God is. So we're going to be talking this morning, and I'm going to be making some connecting points from Malachi and some of the significant things with that. And it may seem like it's just you know, a little bit of a history story here, but let me promise you that the impact that Matthew wanted to have on his readers, that those who would be first engaged with his writing, was very evangelistic. Eyes open. This is the Christ whom you crucified. He was prophesied from the Old Testament. You need to repent of your sins and come to faith in him because there's life that we can have in his name. That's the intent. And he will, he'll get to that, but we're, we can only cover a small portion of that here this morning. So Matthew chapter 17. Open your Bible with me there this morning. Let me get there myself. Here we go. Um, in, our, in our scripture this morning, notice how tantalating this is. You ready for it? We're going to see how John the Baptist not only came in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 through 4, which Matthew pointed out for us. Remember back in Matthew chapter 3, he made that very obvious to us. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight, right? So he's already made that extremely clear for us. But we're also going to see from our text this morning that John the Baptist also fulfilled the role of another Old Testament prophecy this time from the prophet Malachi. And specifically, what Malachi said in the, in the end of his last chapter, of chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Um, and so what I want us to do is I want us to just jump over. I'm going to jump over for us real fast. Watch this. Ready? Here, we're going to go here. I'm going to get rid of that one. Don't need it. We're going to go here. Now, this right here, you can see, this, this shows us the entirety of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, and I've got it highlighted for, well, because I'm about to go there. That's why I've got it. I touched it, and so I went to Malachi, and what we see is there's only four chapters in Malachi, and in Malachi chapter four, there's only six verses. So what this lets us know, and is we, we can see this really nicely here, um, from Malachi, the last Old Testament prophet who prophesied in the Old Testament, to the Gospels, to the time of Matthew, we have what's historically known as a time of 400 years of silence. A period in which there were no prophets, there was no word coming from God, there was no revelation from heaven. The heavens went silent for 400 years. And so it's interesting to think about <clears throat> um, the very last chapter of Malachi, 
and in particular the, the last two verses of the chapter of Malachi. And wouldn't you know it, it might have something to do with a man named John the Baptist who shows up where? Oh, in the book of Matthew as the forerunner to the Messiah. It's not coincidental. This is how God writes books. He just takes 400 years between his last prophet of the Old Testament to the coming of John in the New. And so I thought it would be interesting for us to go to Malachi chapter 4, that last chapter, the last word that God gave through a prophet in the Old Testament to the nation prior to the coming of the forerunner to the Messiah. And so we're going to go to verse 1 of Malachi, the last book. Notice this. He says, For behold, the day is coming burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant, every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them their root nor branch. Malachi uses here what I'm just going to kind of call very general or generic prophetic language not trying to get into all and every last little nitty gritty detail of what that is going to look like this burning like a furnace that all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff so we're not getting into a wooden literal understanding of the words that are being used here it's it's prophetic language and it's very general prophetic language where Malachi is letting the people know that a day is coming when uh, the Lord God will bring judgment against, as it says, the arrogant and every evildoer, and he will leave them neither root nor branch. There's a day coming when their posterity will be completely removed from the earth, and they will be remembered no more. It's a very significant warning, would you say not? But, verse 2, but for you who fear my name... The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. In verse 2 we see almost a complete um, juxtaposition from what verse 1 lays out. This time of judgment. It's going to be a time of burning of this great furnace where every evildoer and the arrogant will be done away with completely. But for you, the people of God. But for you, the people of God, and how we know that the people of God is because they fear the name of God. People of God fear the name of God. Jesus said it something like this, He who has my commandments and wants to keep them, he it is who loves me. No. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Now, you can't get mad at the messenger, because that sounds pretty pretty tight, does it not? Sounds pretty tight. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Well, the people of God are people who fear his name, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. God's people walk in wisdom. We see a lion in the street, we don't go out to the street to pet the lion. We walk in wisdom. We walk away from the lion. It's just called basic common sense. And God gives us knowledge to know that that lion will probably eat my hand if I try to pet it. So I'm not going to the lion. If we fear his name. And notice, if we, if we go from the, the, who fear his name, and notice, let's skip the next part where it says, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Notice this part right here. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. There's a day coming when the people of God are going to be rejoicing in the same way. Have you ever seen a calf skip from from its stall? It gets loud. That thing is the happiest, go lucky little thing you've ever seen in your life. It's the cutest thing. You know that thing is having its best day ever, right? Every single time that calf comes out of the stall, it's having its best day ever. And he's saying there's a day that's coming for the people of God who fear his name, that your day is going to be just like that. It's so unimaginable for us now, but that day is coming. Now, we see that it's a new day that's coming because of what we've kind of passed over where it says, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Again, very prophetic language describing, in essence, a new day that's coming. And it, and it mentions something here that I find very interesting. It, it refers to the 
this, the, the sun, the, the rising of the sun, but it's the sun, not just any old sun, but it's the sun of righteousness, because in that day, there's going to be a righteousness that's going to reign. There's going to be a new day that's coming where righteousness will reign. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And it's a day when, all, when, you know, when there will be no more sin, no more tears. And the people of God will be skipping about like calves from stalls. What a beautiful, glorious day that will be. You, verse 3, now it kind of gets serious again. So it goes from serious to rejoicing, back to serious. Verse 3. But you <clears throat> will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. So there's a transition back to what he was talking about here in verse 1. A day that is coming. The arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff and the day that is coming will set them ablaze. <clears throat> they will be like ashes under the soles of your feet, verse 3, on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord. So before this glorious day of righteousness, when the people of God who fear his name will be like calves dancing out of their stalls because they're in the presence of the king of kings, the Lord Jesus himself, the Messiah at his second advent when he's ruling and reigning with a rod of iron of righteousness. Before that, it seems in verse 3 that it says there's going to get, he goes back again to this day of judgment that he's preparing where they will tread down the wicked. And it reminds me of a more refined prophecy. This is a very general prophecy, but it reminds us of a very much more refined prophecy from the book of Revelation when you get to the end of Revelation when it talks about how the, those who are clothed in white come back with him who rides on a white horse and they tread down the unbelievers and the blood from, the, 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 from those will rise up to the bridle on the horse's uh, neck, right? So we get more specific revelation later, but it, it, in a very general sense right here, we're seeing that there's judgment that has to precede restoration. And we've been talking about this, especially last week and perhaps even the week before that. These disciples were having a hard time. They did not understand, or I'm going to show you again, they completely did not understand the distinction between the first advent and the second advent of Jesus. We're going to, I'm going to show you that in just a second, again, in a different way than I did last week. But remember, notice verse 4. So in the meantime, here's what you do. Remember the law of Moses, my servant. The statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel, right? They were to remember the law of Moses, the servant of God. This is how they fear the Lord. This is how they show reverence for the Lord is they walk in obedience to his word. And Moses left them statutes and ordinances. But remember, what did Moses ultimately, ultimately tell and leave the nation with? Remember Deuteronomy 18.15? We looked at last week. It says, the Lord your God, Moses said this, the Lord your God, this was Moses to the nation. One of the last words from the prophets is, remember Moses, remember what he taught you. And the, the most significant thing, it seems, that Moses taught them comes from Deuteronomy 18.15. Really? Because it says, the Lord your God, Moses wrote this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. And what Moses told the people to do was that when the Lord God raises up a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, Moses tells them, you shall listen to him. Moses is recognizing there's going to be a transference from listening to him, remembering the law of, of Moses and my servant, the statutes and ordinances which, which I commanded him and Horeb for all of Israel, because the last thing that Moses told them to do is, hey, listen, you need to do all of this, but there's a day that's coming when God's going to raise up another greater Moses. And Moses himself said to the people, remember what Moses, my servant, said? He said, listen to that guy. Now, who was it in our text 
two weeks ago that was up on the mountain with Jesus. So it was Peter, it was James, and it was John, these disciples. And who was up on the mountain talking with Jesus? It was, it was Moses, and it was Elijah. Well, right here in, in verse 4, we, we have the connection with Moses, and right there in verse 5, we've got a connection with Elijah. But they were up on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. This is coming from the last prophet of the Old Testament. 400 years of silence. The last chapter he reminds them of has something to do very specifically with a second advent of Jesus who's going to come with wrath and then restoration. And it's got something to do with Moses. Oh, Jesus comes down from that mountain having clearly established him, himself as the greater Moses because as he was talking with Moses and Elijah, Peter had decided, Lord, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Wouldn't it be great if I just made tabernacles for all of you to stay? We, we could just stay up here forever. We could, I could enjoy this for a long time, Lord. A cloud envelops them. Moses and Elijah are gone. The voice comes from heaven. This is my son. And that voice said the exact same thing that Moses said all, that, all those many years ago. Listen to him. Jesus comes down that mountain in the minds of Peter, James, and John unequivocally as the second Moses to whom they need to pay attention to and listen to. The new lawgiver, Jesus. Who said, as Matthew articulated very clearly at the beginning, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill the law. And he comes as the great law fulfiller and now the new law giver. Moses handed the baton off to Jesus. Jesus, listen to my son. Well, that's what the prophet reminded him. Hey, you keep doing what Moses tells you to do and the commandments that he left you. And the last one of the most important things was this. And then notice verse 5. We'll get into John the Baptist here in a second. But notice verse 5. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So this great and terrible day of the Lord that's being referenced here would obviously we could go back and repeat it again from verse 1, chaff and destruction, no root nor branch, uh, the trampling of the wicked, verse 3, like ash undid the soles of your feet for the day in which I'm preparing. But, but, but before, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, he says, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet, right? So, this Elijah, verse 6, is going to restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children of the fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse, with a blight, a permanent curse where no inhabitation will come upon that land again. Because, obviously, what we're going to see is, is, is there is going to be um, uh, calves leaping. The children of God, the people of God who fear his name, are going to be skipping forth and about like calves from a stall. So there's going to be a restoration of hearts Father's hearts, children's hearts, one to one another, and to the Lord God himself. Again, very general prophetic language that is being spoken about here in Malachi chapter 4, the last chapter. I'm, why, do I, why do I repeat this? Because through repetition, there's oftentimes learning takes place. The, the last chapter of the Old Testament, 400 years of silence, this is what the prophet, this is what God left them with. And then who shows up on the scene in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 3? John the Baptist. And what we're going to see is that John the Baptist is the one who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. How do we know that? Well, number one, we know that because Jesus specifically is going to say that. Oh, and what did Moses say about the greater Moses who's coming? Whatever he said, listen to him. So when it comes to giving interpretive value to passages from the Old Testament, are you going to listen to what the scribes have been teaching your whole lives, disciples? Or are you going to listen to him who told you something specifically and something new with regard to this coming of one like Elijah? We'll get, we're going to get to that in, in, ju in just a bit. Okay? But are you, are you tracking with me so far? I'm setting up this passage because this passage in Matthew 17 is... is um, it is full. It is full with meaning. And if you were one of Matthew's original hearers of this, you've already rejected this kind of teaching and this kind of meaning about who Jesus is. And Matthew is trying to take another swing at that and trying to knock that out of the park so that your eyes too might could be open as were theirs to understanding. Because one of the last things that they're going to say in verse 13 of our passage this morning, is that then the disciples, notice, understood what he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. 
when you have your eyes open to the new lawgiver and what he speaks, it changes things. We're going to get there again in just a bit. But Jesus, in our passage, is going to help his disciples make understanding of this Malachi prophecy in a way that they never could have or would have without his aid to unpacking its truth and the insights of its truth because he obviously is the greater Moses who has such insights. And this is how they start growing and learning and understanding and gaining insight into what we refer to as New Testament revelation. Progressive revelation. A little bit shadowed or hidden in the old and more revealed in the new. That's a kind of a general way of sometimes thinking about it and speaking about it. And this is, this is one of the passages where we see this very plainly. Now, I want you to jump back over with me to the book of Matthew. Oh, I did have the last two of Malachi. Sorry about that. But here in verse 17, let's get into our passage in 17.9 and quickly work our way through this. In Matthew 17.9, notice the significance. We, we hit on this primarily last week, but I'm going to start here again with this this morning. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. So again, as we saw last week, here in verse 9, Jesus tells Peter, James, and John not to say a word about what they have experienced on this mountaintop experience with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah up there. That of seeing Jesus shining like the brightness of sun, that of seeing Moses and Elijah, that of hearing the conversation of Jesus' exodus, of hearing the voice from heaven telling them only to listen to him. He says, keep all that to yourselves until after he has risen from the dead. And if you missed last week's sermon, if you weren't here last week, I spent the entire time um, expounding on uh, the biblical theological significance of this one verse. And so if you missed that, I would encourage you to go back to the Jinx Bible uh, YouTube page. You can subscribe there and listen and um, get caught up to speed with more of the details relative to uh, verse uh, 9 here in chapter 17. And there's a reason why Jesus wants these uh, disciples to keep this information uh, private. He, he's going to use them, if you will, as uh, specifically as eyewitnesses to, to when he is later teaching uh, his disciples relative to his, um, the coming of the kingdom and when that's going to take place and his ascension back to heaven, those 40 days we talked about last week from a Acts chapter 1. Remember that, those of you who were here, right? And, and so these disciples are going to be those who, when Jesus starts to extrapolate on that, they can say, yes, what he is saying is absolutely true. We heard it ourselves. Now let me tell you about what we experienced when we were up on the mountain. More of that in the sermon I preached last week. If you didn't get that, you can go and listen to it. Let's move on. Look at verse 10. Now, notice the disciples' question. That of Peter, James, and John, not the whole group. That of Peter, James, and John after everything they've just witnessed and experienced while on the mountain with Jesus. Notice their question. And his disciples, those three, asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And this, as we just looked at from Malachi chapter 4, uh, from that Old Testament, the last chapter, all that, this is the only reference point for which these disciples could have this context of Elijah in mind. There is no other passage that talks about Elijah and his coming and needing to come first before something. And so, as mentioned last week, these disciples, Peter, James, and John specifically, well, and this is what the rest of the disciples and all the rest of the nation also had absolutely no understanding about, was this distinction between a first coming and a second coming. They had no way of distinguishing between these two advents. Now, you might say, well, was it not written in the scriptures? Yes, it was written. But they didn't have the eyes to see. They didn't have an unveiling of the truth of the meaning of these things. And that's one of the things that Jesus is doing for them in this encounter that he has given them up on this mountain. So when Peter, James, and John learn of Jesus' suffering, death, resurrection, and eventual ascension back to heaven, their most natural and obvious question that they have while coming down the mountain with him is what we see here in Verse 10, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? In other words, after learning of all of that, they're left confused about Israel's prospects of a national restoration. 
What did we see in Malachi 4, 1 through 6? We saw what? Judgment before restoration. A great day of judgment before the skipping like calves from the stalls. And so after hearing what Jesus had taught them and what they had been exposed to with Moses and Elijah up on the mountain, their question is, is then, then why do the scribes, why have they been teaching us our entire lives this passage from Malachi chapter 4 that says Elijah must come first? Where, how is all this making sense? They're utterly confused. Confused about what they've always heard their scribes teaching them with regard to the day, the day of the Lord's judgment against these unbelieving nations. They're thinking, how could our Messiah be going away? This is what they, they, they had heard about his departure, his exodus. They're thinking, how could our Messiah be going away when Elijah and the coming day of the Lord's vengeance against our political enemies hasn't even happened? Why then did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? We see here that their thinking is in utter confusion and disarray. They are still longing for national restoration. They are still longing for a day of vengeance, a day of God's vengeance against the arrogant and the evildoers. In a day when they, the people of God, would be dancing about like calves from stalls. Jesus has just mentioned to them while up previously before going up on the mountain and then up on the mountain that of his, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and then his great exodus, and Moses and Elijah were confirming that. Well, I thought, I thought there was judgment and restoration. Why then have the scribes been teaching us all along this passage out of Malachi this particular way? Not making sense. Notice how Jesus gives them their answer in verse, beginning in verse 11. And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. You're right. You heard him right. Elijah is coming and will restore all things. The day of judgment and restoration. Elijah's going to come before these things. But, verse 12. But I say to you, now does this not bring back to your recollection, your recollection the Sermon on the Mount? That formula that, that Jesus would often use? You have heard it said this, but I say to you that. You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you that, remember that pattern, that formula? And he kind of went through that on several different occasions. We see in essence the, simil the simil similar formula even right here. But I say to you that, oh, oh, he is coming. He's going to restore all things. But I say to you that, the new lawgiver, what does he do? He says, um, he already came. But I say to you that he, he already came and they did not recognize him. The nation did not recognize him. But instead did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Perhaps it seems like a little bit of a difficult text to get our head wrapped around, but in essence what Jesus, the new lawgiver, is saying is that, yes, John the Baptist, he's the one that came as a typological fulfillment of this Elijah figure who is going to come before judgment and restoration. It's already happened. That portion of what Malachi prophesied about has happened. Its fulfillment was in John the Baptist. And when you start to get your head around that, it starts changing your eschatological understanding of that coming day and when that day may be coming. So Jesus here is starting a process of correcting their thinking relative to the mission and ministry of himself, of Messiah, that of two comings, of a first advent for suffering, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension, and a second coming that will be had with wrath and restoration. He, he begins a process of helping them start contextualizing a right understanding and how to rightly understand these Old Testament prophecies. 
And this one in particular is where the prophecy of Malachi finds its place in the history of the working out of and for the people of God who fear his name and long for that coming. We see in verse 11 here that Jesus, after affirming the reality of the coming of of Elijah, he's, he's giving credence to what was stated. They just misunderstood the way it was to be understood. Again, verse 12 and 13, that, that's been fulfilled typologically. And we see, I'm going to use Logos again for us, and we see how in the Gospels, come on, give me, give me some help here, all the way over in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, let's go to verse 13. We see how over in the gospel of of Luke, how an angel by the name of Gabriel makes mention of these very realities. Notice how the the angel Gabriel says this to John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, from Luke 1, 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. This again, John the Baptist. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. What did we see in Malachi's prophecy? That of the ministry of that Elijah figure who was going to come and turn the hearts of the fathers of the sons, sons of the fathers, He will turn many sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. He's quoting directly. Gabriel knows the word of God. How about that? And he's quoting directly from Malachi chapter 4 to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. Because if you were reading the book of Malachi and you understood there was a day of wrath coming and then followed by restoration, which part of that do you want to be in? Restoration. You want to be one of those who fear the Lord. You don't want to be one of those that the scorching furnace has done away with, root and branch the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Jesus affirmed what Malachi prophesied and Jesus affirmed what Gabriel said would be true of John. That John the Baptist is the embodiment of Elijah in both spirit and power. In John's ministry in the wilderness of one crying out for repentance of sin and of turning back to the Lord was, as Malachi said, that which was going to come and happen prior to the beginning of the day of the Lord's wrath. Prior to the coming of the Lord's judgment against all those arrogant and every evil doer. What's the most arrogant thing and the most evil thing anybody could do? It would be unbelief. The most perverse thing that anyone could do would be to disbelieve the realities of the one true and living God and His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He sent to be the Messiah and Savior of the world. There could be nothing more perverse or more evil or more worthy of judgment, more worthy of scorching furnace, heat, root, branch, obliteration than the rejection of the truth of God himself. And that's what Jesus is letting his disciples soak in. That's what Matthew, in writing to the nation of Israel, affirms through Peter and James and John, and they're questioning everything that that, that Jesus, that they've been learning from the time that Jesus let them know that, they, that, they are, that he is heading to Jerusalem and that he has to suffer and die and be raised. Ever since then, they have been wrestling with and having their, their minds augmented in favor of what the new lawgiver is teaching them relative to the purpose and ministry of Messiah. And again, for us, it perhaps seems like a, an academic 
endeavor. Just more head knowledge, more Bible knowledge. That's why I started off with you saying that to, and for Matthew, this was something far more significant than, significant than just head knowledge and Bible knowledge. This had everything to do with lives. Lives of those, again, very evangelistic. Wanting people to turn from not having a right understanding of who Jesus is, of repenting of that, and of coming to saving faith in the one who gave his life for the free forgiveness of their sins so that one day they too could be like, as Malachi said, calves skipping from stalls instead of being chaff under the feet of the coming judgment and wrath of God. The, the options seem very plain and very staggering and very realistic. And as I made mention to you last week, they should be that which still moves us even today to be more evangelistic. So, how do we today use a passage like this as we're just living normal day lives, right? I can tell that that was y'all's biggest question coming in here this morning. Yeah, how do, how do we use this to be more evangelistic, Pastor, right? Right? Well, I don't know specifically for you, okay? But how I might do this is when I'm in conversation with anybody at any place, it just make whatever, wherever we're at, and, I inter, and I'm making introductions or what, and we end up talking about the Word of God. If I have somebody that, that is vehemently objecting to the, the, the recognition of Jesus as being uh, the Son of God prophesied from the Old Testament, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. This is a place that I could particularly take them and show them how Matthew, who was a Jew, who Matthew was in the first century, lived with Jesus when he came, not some scholar 2,000 years later writing a review of, of perhaps what these eyewitnesses said, but what Jesus had to say about them. And this passage right here goes all the way back to the heart of the last prophet of the Old Testament, the last verses of the Old Testament prophecy before 400 years of silence, and it was John who burst on the scenes to bring a restoration of hearts back for, for the people of God, back to a truth of God through a preaching of repentance for the kingdom of heaven, he said, is at hand. And it was Matthew who here in the training of, through Jesus' training of the twelve, uses Malachi, dips into it. Mountaintop experience. He's headed for his death. I, I could weave together some, some historical narrative with the use of the Old Testament in an evangelistic way to try to show and convince, now I can't convince anybody, but to prove logically through Scripture that it's not contradictory but it's affirming that Jesus is who exactly who he claimed to be. Exactly who Malachi said he was going to be. That John the Baptist was exactly who Malachi prophesied him to be. Etc, etc, etc. So these are ways that we can use God's word evangelistically even though it's not as um, pretty of a passage and as easy to use as others might be. Okay? Now I want to show you one more thing. Notice verse 12 again. Excuse me, 11 and 12, like one more time. It says, And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. That last sentence right there, you see that? Jesus makes a comparative. So also, in the same way that the nation allowed the the Roman authorities, Herod Antipas, to do to John whatever he wished. There was no outcry. There was no backlash. There was no, there was no uh, restraint from the nation to say, this is one of our guys. In the same way, so also, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And it won't be many days from now when these same hands will be crying out, crucify him, desiring for Roman centurions to take care of that process on their behalf. Jesus, again, makes recognition of the reality that he is going to go in the, uh, in the same way as did John. 
before, was that Elijah? Yeah, it was Elijah who John came in the embodiment and the, the spirit and power of. In the same way, he's going to do that. And then in verse 13, and I think this is a really significant, significant point that I made mention of just briefly early on. Then the disciples understood. The disciples understood that he, Jesus, had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Is this a difficult passage? Yes? No? Yeah? I mean, if you're just reading through Matthew and you kind of just read through Matthew 17, are you getting all this? No. Understanding takes time. Is understanding ultimately valuable? Absolutely, without question. Jesus has been working with his group now, these men, these disciples, for almost a period of three years. And he is still at work with them to change their understanding of who he is so that they can be the witnesses that will take his gospel all around the world. Understanding takes time. The disciples understood. Understanding, what does it do? Understanding brings about direction. When we have a right understanding of something, we know how we can then move properly forward with that understanding. And this is why biblical exploration on your point of being a Berean and digging into the Word and eating the Word and trying to... Because through that, you will continue to grow and gain understanding that's going to be then like a lamp. That understanding becomes a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. And it shows you more of how you can be the people of God who fear His name and walk in accordance to His ordinances. The disciples did this first. We're still doing it 2,000 years later. We're growing in our understanding so that we, like they, can live meaningful lives for the short period of time that we have here on planet Earth. Make it count, church.